Now, you may have noticed we dressed for the occasion. So we are wearing, modelling these lovely white coats. Can I just say it wasn't my idea, but that said, it looks great. But so, it was a good idea. Yeah, it was a good idea. So we, we, we're quite excited about this. It's a new, it's a new collaboration for us. Um, Alexandra will tell you more about it. So my co-moderator today is Alexandra Peters from uh, Geneva in Switzerland. My name's John Otter. I work in London and in Fetch Control. Um, and I think probably without further ado, to try and keep us on track, I'll hand straight over to Alexandra for our first talk, Keeping Hospitals Clean. Where is the evidence? What are patients' expectations? Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm here to present a little bit about what Clean Hospitals is already, what we would like it to become, and why we're creating this group. And basically, we believe that it's an idea whose time has come. And I declare no conflicts of interest, <laughs> besides working for clean hospitals. <laughs> so why is it so important to have a group on hospital environmental hygiene? Basically, it comes down to that nobody wants to be the next patient in a dirty room. And when you look at a hospital room, there's a bunch of high-touch surfaces that can be reservoirs for different types of bacteria or viruses that can then cause healthcare associated infections. So in her 2014 article, Stephanie Dancer showed that there was a correlation between the number of ICU acquired infections and what she called hygiene failures or times when there was supposed to be a, a hygiene action, either a cleaning or disinfection of a certain surface and that didn't work. So as you can see, and numerous studies have, have looked at this in, in more detail. But as you can see, the more that there's issues with not cleaning enough in the environment and not disinfecting enough in the environment, the more often that healthcare-associated infections become an issue. So it's not just hand hygiene, it's also environmental hygiene. This is another study uh, by Mitchell et al. that shows that the risk of acquisition of organisms uh, goes up quite drastically if the patient before you in the room was a carrier. So you can see that for, for certain ones, it's over four and a half, like for Acinetobacter, it's over uh, four times the risk of acquiring that colonization. So concerning cleaning products, what do we know? We have a lot of information, a lot of literature about which products are out there, which pathogens they can kill or remove, how to apply them. We have quite a bit on the efficacy and toxicity of said products and methods. We have some clinical studies and we're starting to get some better studies out there on the impact on healthcare associated infection. So the reason why hospital environmental hygiene is so complex is because it's not just a question of having the right cleaning product or having the right UV lamp or having the right literature to base your practices on, but there's also human elements and the stakes are quite high. So basically you have to balance people's behavior with the available technologies and the research. And the variables that most affect the quality of uh, environmental hygiene is the people or workforce, so the acronym is WASTE, but the, the individuals that are responsible for doing the cleaning and disinfecting and verifying that everything's been done, the environment which is going to be treated, and that includes if the surface is porous or not porous, is it intact, what type of surface is it? What part of the world are you in? What's the level of contamination? All of those things play a role in that. The substance is the product that you use in order to clean or decontaminate a surface. And so that can be either a detergent or it can be a disinfectant or it can be, yeah, anything else. And then um, technique is how you're, how you're cleaning. So it can be anything from a, a microfiber cloth, or how, you, how you 
rub down a surface with microfiber to how you push a floor cleaning machine. And then the equipment is the actual cloth or the actual machines that you're using in order to do your cleaning. So the reason why all of these are important is because if any one of these elements doesn't work, then your end result is not going to be hygiene. And the best uh, analogy that I've found is, imagine that you're making an apple pie. So your workforce is your little brother and he's not very good at mixing the batter. And the place, the area that you're working in is you put the pie on a windowsill and maybe the cat knocks it off the windowsill while the pie is cooling. The substance, you have apples with worms in them and your flour tastes like chemicals. And the technique is, well, you didn't really follow any recipe. And then your oven heats unevenly, so you have faulty equipment as well. Even if just one of these things are off, it can make bad apple pie. So it's important to realize that you can't ignore any one of those variables when you're talking about hospital environmental hygiene. So the issues that we face in the field is that the literature is still limited. Good interventional studies are rare, although there's more of them, most notably the REACH study, uh, but John will talk more about that one. The quality of products and the methods available are heterogeneous, and they vary greatly from resource level to geographic area to even from one hospital to another, and they're often not chosen based on best available evidence or even the best way that we could spend the five dollars we have to spend on this. Very often it's just chosen because I know someone who works at that company or this is how we've always done it or we really like the smell of bleach. So there's also issues with environmental hygiene personnel is basically they're, in most of the literature they're still called housekeeping. And that doesn't at all describe the scientific nature and the importance of the work that they're doing. And these people are generally underpaid. They're oftentimes not that educated. Hospitals are generally understaffed because whenever there's a need to cut budget, you cut budget from the cleaners. And, it's, and they work really long days. And the work is physically taxing and ergonomically difficult. So those are all variables that need to be addressed. Another issue is that when you're talking about the division of labor between someone who is working in hospital environmental hygiene and someone who's a nursing assistant, sometimes their activities tend to overlap. And unless everybody's very clear about what they're supposed to be doing, said thing is not going to get done. For example, a bedside table. If nobody knows exactly who is responsible for cleaning a bedside table, that bedside table, I guarantee you, will not be clean. And this gets even more complicated when a lot of the environmental hygiene gets outsourced from the hospitals in order to cut costs. So the formula for success is the innovations and the products that we use, a way to implement them effectively, also taking into account pedagogy, implementation science, and having contexts that are enabling for the workforce, whoops, for the workforce and for management. And only that way are you going to be able to have socially significant outcomes where people understand the importance of their job, where they don't see their job as just wiping down a table and it doesn't matter why, but they understand their work in the context of patient safety. So we need clear definitions. At the beginning when we were writing our first paper after uh, InterClean last year, I think John and I and uh, Didi as well, we spent months, and Pierre, actually everybody, we spent months Alex. trying to figure out what's, what, what do you call it when you wipe a surface with a detergent? Is that cleaning or can it be decontamination or what do we call the cleaners? Do we call them housekeeping or cleaners? Or as we chose hospital environmental hygiene personnel, which is long, but at least it says what we're trying to say. Um, so definitions are, are difficult and they vary from area to area and from country to country. And so it's important that we have a working language that we can all understand each other and all sort of work toward common ideas. And then international guidelines are often quite different depending on where you are and they're not always evidence-based and they're not always up to what the latest standards are in the, in the field. 
Uh, we need more tools for education and implementation because oftentimes, especially for environmental hygiene personnel, people say, well, you just tell them to wipe a toilet. How hard is it to wipe a toilet? Well, I'm here to tell you, cleaning a toilet is science. It, you, you need to care about what sort of material are you using. Are you using microfiber? Are you using a different kind of cloth? Are you using a disinfectant or detergent or both? Would you need to do it twice if you do it with two different products? Are you going, how are you moving your hand? Are you moving from a clean area to a dirty area or are you accidentally moving from a dirty area to a clean area? If the environmental hygiene personnel moves over one spot twice with their hand, they're basically just spreading those pathogens right back over where they wiped away. And it's really difficult after having cleaned our own houses for all our lives to understand that you can't go over the same spot twice with a rag. So all of those things are, are important and also taking yeah, implementation science and pedagogy into account when training these people and training them for, for professions, not for quick jobs where there's a high turnover. So we also need to shift how hospitals view environmental hygiene and they need to get out of the vicious cycle of cutting costs and start thinking about what is the value of focusing on environmental hygiene how much money can we save by preventing healthcare associated infections? And John will go into that in much more detail as well. So, but just really quickly, so return on investment for good hand hygiene is up to 23 times. There's a study that says it was seven times for $7 for every dollar spent on hand hygiene. There's one that says it was 23. Either way, that's a really good return on investment. There's not a lot of other implementations that you can do in a hospital and get that kind of ROI. So what is it for hospital environmental hygiene? We don't quite know, but it's quite good as well. Um, some studies estimate that the increased costs associated with antimicrobial resistance are over, will be over 85 trillion euros by 2050. And even a small outbreak of 40 individuals can easily run over a million euros. So that's much, much, much more expensive to deal with that if that was a, an outbreak caused by a failure in environmental hygiene. So we created clean hospitals because we have, we have issues at the moment with products and equipment. There's things on the market that are worse than useless. There's things on the market that are harmful. There's a lack of standardization in the field. The definitions we already spoke about are heterogeneous. We have huge issues with cleaning personnel. Guidelines, standards, and practices are not up to par. There's gaps, some are too prescriptive. Some guidelines will tell you, you need to clean spore-forming organisms with this brand of bleach. And there's other guidelines that say, you need to clean spore-forming organisms, period. So it's about finding what is really important and what works and what is aligned with the best and most recent science in the field. There's also a lack of synthesis of the evidence that's present in the literature. So things tend to be scattered and the people that are responsible for environmental hygiene in a hospital tend to not have the time to go look through everything and dig through all this literature in order to be able to make decisions. And it's difficult to make a business case to, hospital, to hospitals because traditionally, Cleaning is something we don't want to think about. Cleaning is something that we outsource, that we give to people that are uneducated, that sometimes people that don't even speak the same language. There's countries where the cleaners speak another language, I mean in Switzerland to some degree as well, but, and we're the only person that understands both the, the, the nursing staff and the cleaners is an external person that comes and does trainings once for three days, and then the rest of the time it's pointing at objects and saying, yes, no, do it like this. And that's the, extent of, that's the extent of what we're working with. So it's really important to change how hospitals think about this as well. And again, the availability of quality trainings. So Clean Hospitals is an environmental hygiene network, and it's connecting experts and stakeholders from around the world with the goal of improving environmental hygiene in hospitals, keeping the patient at the center of this, benefiting public health by lowering healthcare associated infections, reducing antimicrobial resistance, protecting staff as well, not just the patients, 
and also thinking from an ecological point of view, because there's a lot of things that we're putting into the environment that are becoming dangerous for us in the medium and long term as well. So the group is composed of industry, healthcare experts, cleaning experts, hospital management, governments, and other key stakeholders and individuals. And the objectives are to develop this network and to support ongoing initiatives to focus in healthcare settings around the world. So the way it's set up is there's the Clean Hospitals Board, and then there's the stakeholders, which are mainly industry. The board is uh, Pierre Parnet, Andreas Vos, Didier Pité, John, Marianne uh, Kemmer, and, then, and Ermira Tartari. And then uh, it's sort of broken up into different branches. So there's the management and administration. So that's all for communication, logistics, etc. The education committee, which is working on a core curriculum, which means what are we actually teaching people that are in hospital environmental hygiene, or how are we teaching them? You know, we're saying wipe this surface. How do we get them to understand how to wipe the surface? So it's part pedagogy, part implementation science, and part very sort of everyday technical, what product you use where, at what time, for how long, and why. Then the trainings in environmental hygiene were starting to develop training modules in different, in different key areas that uh, our stakeholders are in, so in air, water, surfaces, sterilization, etc. We also have a communication and events committee. We work very closely with Interclean, and there's Rob here. <laughs> and we got our start at Interclean and have been very much supported through them. And then we also work very closely with ICPIC. ISWA is the International Solid Waste Association, the Hygiene Forum, and the World uh, Federation for Hospital Sterilization. And then on the research side, we have an academic task force. So that's the research that's developed by academics. And that's a systematic review on healthcare associated infection and the environment. A model for, a, sort of an economic model for the cost and value of what happens when we invest in hospital environmental hygiene and how much money do we save. And the white paper, which is published now, saying who we are and what we're trying to do. And that was in the European Cleaning Journal. And I believe it's out. Yep. And then the subgroups are groups that are company-led because they're sort of special interests. So industry decides, I want to talk about mapping guidelines. And who else wants to talk about mapping guidelines with me? And then the other industries in our group get together. And then there's always academics in the group. And they. Two minutes? It's OK. <laughs> I'm almost done. There's academics in the group, and then they lead and follow the work that's, that's proposed. So that way, we can see the gaps in the guidelines, how to address them, and then have a position on it or an official opinion. We're also working a lot on fake news, a transposable model for hospital hygiene, sort of if I have $5 and this is my environment and this is my hospital and these are the pathogens that are most important to me and this is what my infrastructure looks like, where should I invest? So that's a long term one and another group on sterilization and device reprocessing. So this I already spoke about. And so what's important to keep in mind is that cleaning environmental hygiene is a science. We need more research to make a stronger case. Hospitals need to get out of this cycle of cutting costs, and they need to think about assessing value, and that we all need to work together in order to protect patients. Thank you very much. Sorry, we have one minute for questions. Yeah, so what we do at the end of each talk, if there's time, we'll have a, a quick burning question or two, um, and then we've got 10 minutes for more discussion at the end. So does anybody have a quick question for Alexandra? Yeah, one at the front here. Thank you very much for your presentation. How do you think that uh, current, and even more the future, knowledge on dry biofilms will change our vision, requirements, expectations, standards for cleaning and disinfection? I don't know enough about biofilms, but I would say Pierre, no? I, I, I'm not an expert at all on that. I can comment a little bit on biofilms. I think it, I think it is game changer, um, knowing that they're there and that they're tough. Um, we need to think about which disinfectants we're using, how we're using them. 
So yeah, it, it, it does change the game. And also there's certain disinfectants that sort of build them up and let them stay sticky and don't break them down. And there's definitely companies that are going into different technologies for that, but I, I don't know enough about biofilms to go into any more detail. Okay. Next question. I think we, we need good? to move on. Okay. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you. Okay, so next up we have um, Dr. Pierre Pano, um, who is a medical doctor working in France, um, in Bordeaux. Uh, he is an expert in public health and fetch control and patient safety, and the past president of the French Society for Hospital Hygiene. Pierre is going to be speaking to us today about an international survey of cleaning and disinfection practices. Thanks a lot, John. Hi, everybody. I have no conflict of interest today, and furthermore, it's my birthday today. I suppose it might be legal to provide me with all the gifts you want. Yeah. The first gift that I received is this white coat, so I'm very happy and proud to wear it. Uh, especially that is the symbol of this new initiative, Clean Hospitals, which for me will, will help us to breathe new life into infection control in the, on the field. So to uh, make the link with uh, Alexandra, lecture, uh, I think that for patients, we do need to have in mind that cleanliness is very important. I've just selected this paper, a Canadian recent paper, uh, which interviewed patients about many things, especially safety, and I took one quote from a patient which for me is the perfect resume of everything. It's not very clean in here for being a hospital, or can you get good safe health when the insides of the room look like hell? I think that's it. And in France, we have met uh, last year uh, a survey with a French patient association specialized in patient safety and the Johnson & Johnson Company. Uh, it's a, an Ipsos survey on a, sample of, a representative sample of the French population about what is the main reason we got surgical site infection. And from the French population, the main reason is hygiene of the premises of the establishment. Obviously, we know that is not the right answer on a scientific point of view. But each of us, if we are in the operating room, before um, being anesthetized, if you see that everything is messy around you and dust and dirt are here, I think we, you will not have sweet dreams during your surgery. So we should have that in mind. It's, it's really important. And uh, I took also this paper for Claire Rock from the Claire Rock from Johns Hopkins Hospital. She uh, interviewed patients about their vision of UVC disinfection in the world. And, so 100 patients, when you coat UVC light helps protect me from an infection, more than 80% say yes. They don't know the, if it's true or not. <laughs> but they say yes, because it's visual, it's technology, and maybe they suppose that if you do that, it's efficient, or otherwise you do, will not do that. And in a way, they are, they are true, obviously. So cleanliness is something really important for, for the patient and for us too. So the unit tips, uh, Network is a gathering of uh, European societies involved in infection control. Um, this network has the additional meeting uh, last year in Berlin and is led by Silvio Brusafero, our Italian colleague from Udine. So uh, it gathering a lot of society from throughout Europe and one of the main work we are performing is to uh, do some very short and uh, survey among the members to assess the situation on a topic. And it's what we decided to do on uh, cleaning and disinfection. So we have uh, several societies that answered from all, Europe, all your, uh, across Europe's clinical microbiology, infection control, nurses, doctors. A very uh, interesting sample of, of societies. So the first question that your society has promoted guidelines. So most of the society uh, has done that. And uh, what was the last update? It uh, ranged from 2007 from 2017. And in the field, we have some innovation, new technology, and I think we need to update that a little more frequently, but it's uh, uh, a vision of what the topic is uh, a priority, maybe from societies. Uh, do you use a classification of risk level for, in order to have different strategy of cleaning and disinfection according to the area, common area, an ICU, or operating room? So, most of the countries and societies use that, except some. And what is interesting is that the classifications are not the same. Some have two 
classes, some three, some four. So it means that we have not the same vision of what to do for the same world. That's the reality. And as Alexander said, it's not easy to have all the, the answers uh, in, the, in the scientific work published. So obviously, uh, cleaning is a team effort. So I've tried to find a picture of Didier Pité when he was a water ski champion, but I didn't succeed. <laughs> so I put a, a French guide, which was at the same time very famous. But whatever good you are, especially in your hospital, when you're alone, there is a lot of things you will never perform like that. <laughs> so uh, we ask our colleagues, so who was in charge of the patient room cleaning? So you have a wide variety of, uh, of answers. Some are only internal employers, some are fully external, and m most are both of them. And you know that in our hospital throughout Europe, we are trying to uh, outsource a little bit uh, cleaning and disinfection, but some are keeping the patient's room and the operating room, but more and more it became uh, open and different. And we know in this field that if the only purpose is to cut cost is, it will also cut quality at the end. So are the nurses uh, responsible of cleaning uh, some equipment? Uh, yes, they perform. Yes, sometimes they're supervising. Most of the time, they are doing both, cleaning and supervising what has done. So it's a, a profession that is really important in the field of uh, the quality of cleaning uh, in uh, the surrounding of the patient. So uh, is the IC team uh, solicitate uh, when you have a specific microorganism? Fortunately, every society answered yes, so we can go and carry on our work. Obviously, uh, the training is a very important part of every uh, job in the hospital, but for the cleaning, it's the case. And we ask people how they are performing cleaning, face-to-face -face or online. Just online training does that exist? Online associated with face-to-face -face does exist. Uh, obviously, face-to-face -face is important. And what is quite exciting is that now we have really interesting studies using behavioral, behavioral change theories applied to cleaning that demonstrate that you really could, can improve the quality of cleaning and even the results while applying these uh, methods to these kind of professionals. And it's one of the goals of clean hospitals to show uh, uh, trainers how to use this new strategy of uh, behavior changes. So uh, who is in charge of managing clinic staff? For a long time, the infection control team was doing that. It was really time consuming, and I have no time to do the rest of the job, which is really important. Now, most of the time in Europe, it's a dedicated person trained to, uh, to supervise the, the cleaners. So in hospital, you have different profession with most of the time different attires or uniform scholars, but the goal is the same at the end, and we need to uh, work together. So uh, we asked if there was a partnership with, between the nursing staff and the cleaning professional. Nobody say never, but just half say always. So there's a gap, and we really know that this kind of staff, when uh, we speak to them, complains most of the time not to be quite enough informed about infection control, infection status of the patients, which measure to, pre to take, etc., etc. So this cooperation is really important. We ask the, the society what for we could expect uh, with these cooperations, and the idea was to create a clean environment and maintain it. It's the, the main purpose, but we have also this uh, feeling of integration of cleaning staff in the working team of an hospital. I think it's very important, and the culture of respect. The two last one is about safety culture, which is quite low in many wards in hospital, especially in France when we measure it. The safety culture is still quite low among the healthcare workers in hospitals. So there are a lot of techniques in the field of cleaning. It's not easy to, to choose. It's like for water skiing. Uh, one question was quite interesting for me. So, uh, do you perform cleaning with two steps? First step, just you remove the dust with a wet gauze, and then you perform cleaning after. Uh, I mean, the field of infection control in France since 1991, and we have always done that, two steps. 
And I was surprised that in Europe it was not the case at all. So maybe it's not that useful. It's very time consuming. And if people are doing something different, we should focus on that and exchange and say, can we save time while doing differently? Or is it really mandatory and you should go back to that? Which are the methods? Quite a usual method, mechanization, flat cleaning, like the mops, damp wiping. A very few European society are using steam cleaning. In France, we are using that a lot. So uh, I think, to my opinion, it's important to have a wide vision of all the things that are efficient and to try to uh, develop uh, all the interesting methods everywhere. So what kind of product do you, do you recommend, mainly for the floor? So more and more, it's just detergent product. It could uh, vary. You have even one answer with water only with microfiber. So don't those who are in advance of uh, new technology and sustainability. And we ask people during an ad break what you are doing. So yeah, there's a kind of improvement. They upgrade their product and move from detergent to detergent disinfectant. Some are staying with the same strategy. What are you using for cleaning surfaces? So reusable wipes, single-use wipes, quite classical, no sponges. So we are happy with that. Obviously, it's important to assess the performances when you are making cleaning. So what are we doing in Europe? Nearly everyone is assessing the quality, but not everyone. So it's a little bit puzzling. What are you doing? Environment control, observational audit, or checklist? So a mix of these three, but we're going to see that uh, among that, there's a wide variety of things. Just take the uh, idea of environmental control. What is it? For most of the people, it's visual inspection of cleanliness. That's the main strategy to control. The microbiological monitoring is quite low. In some countries like France, it's not promoted. And more interesting technology, ATP, bioluminescence, or uh, fluorescent products are not that used. Spain are using ATP a lot, but it's quite rare. I think there's a wide place for improvement to assess the quality of cleaning in, in hospital. So what are the main concern about safety? As you see, uh, allergy and all the things linked with toxicity of the product are those in mind of the society uh, in the field of infection control. Those uh, linked with musculoskeletal disorder, low back troubles are less uh, frequent, but it's also very important. And, one main improvement in cleaning methods is to uh, preserve their healthcare workers. It's important that uh, keep them safe and healthy if you want to have them in the world to make the job. So uh, what are the problems to uh, implement environmental cleaning procedures? According to you, the most common idea is to inadequate education provided to staff. So there's a wide a uh, place to improvement, especially, as I said, in implemented behavioral changes methods, which are now making their uh, first step in this field and are very interesting uh, with the first results we have. So we have also uh, many uh, concerns about time, lack of resources, and also the, the culture of the facility could be a problem. So in conclusion, I, I could say that uh, we have demonstrated a very wide variety of practices in Europe. We didn't expect so much variety in, in the small continent. Uh, obviously, a need for guidelines and to uh, have some harmonization in what we are doing and to associate it with that added science. Obviously, there's also wide room for innovation. It's also a main challenge of clean hospitals. What could help us on a daily basis to improve the quality of the environment, and at the end, also numerous challenges, as you can see, awareness, efficacy, safety, cost, sustainability. There's really a lot, and that was, it's exciting with the, the project of Clean Hospital. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. We have uh, a couple of minutes for any questions, if anybody has any. One in the middle there, if you just wait for the mic. The mic will go to Madam. <laughs> He's on the way. 
Uh, well, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Um, I would just like to add something here. Like when we talk about the environmental hygiene, it takes into account everything which surrounds a patient. So um, whenever we talk about the disinfection or the cleanliness, we always consider the hard um, surfaces like starting from the operation theater, the equipments we are using there, and then when the patients come into the room, we are always focused on surfaces and floor and everything. So I would like to highlight the porous soft materials here, like uh, patient privacy curtains and the bed linen and pillow covers. Uh, don't you think they are equally important? Uh, yes, uh, I think, as uh, Alexandra said, you have the eye touch surfaces around the patients, but. Uh, tomorrow we have a, an early session with Alexandra about the topic and uh, there are some studies that demonstrated that the contamination is going far from the patient since if you forgot what is distant from the patient you miss a piece of the contamination it's not easy to make always the link between the transmission to the further patients but I think we should not only focus on surrounding obviously some most often touch those. it's the priority but you have to have strategy maybe from some the most dangerous or transmissible pathogen. We need to target everything in the room. So it's a question of cost effectiveness and strategy, but I think you're right. We should have a global vision of all the environment. In France, we do not use really privacy curtain, but in the literature, obviously, uh, there's a lot, a lot of microorganisms of them. <laughs> Actually, we are working on this project in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, but our project is collaborated with a hospital. So we are basically working on the bad linen and uh, hospital uh, patient privacy curtains. And uh, we have developed a coating for it, which is antibacterial. And uh, before deploying the uh, curtains for the patient's privacy, we dip it in that coating, and then uh, we have like control and treatment curtains. So we have got a very significant uh, reduction in the bacterial load up to 98 to 99 percent after uh, deploying that coating on the curtain. Yeah, I think we need to be open to everything today. In the hospital, there's a lot of what uh, the Canadian called gray zones, that the zone that nobody's in charge of. Uh, at the end, it's never clean. So if you can provide some automatic help, it's very interesting. We have to demonstrate the efficacy. We, we have to have good standard, and there's a new French standard around that, which is uh, developing at the international level at the time. So. We need to be open to everything, to my opinion, and uh, everything that could help people and save time, it's good. Thank you very much. There is a question towards the back, I think. Maybe it's gone away. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you, Pierre. So next up, we'd like to welcome Andrea Moldovan, who is a doctor from St. Constantin Hospital in Romania, who won the Hand Hygiene Excellence Award in 2015. Yes, yes. <laughs> long time ago. Okay. Thank you for being here with us, and happy anniversary, uh, Pierre, again, from uh, my part. Uh, I will uh, try to present you some thoughts about the new technologies in infection prevention and control. It is about past, present, and future. My name is Andrea Moldovan. I'm an advocate of hand hygiene, IPC, antibiotic stewardship, and good medical practices. And I uh, visited a lot of Romanian hospitals, Romanian uh, medical universities, and students in order to present uh, our work. I come from a multidisciplinary team with four main research, research directions. First of all, referring to professionals in epidemiology. Uh, the second one, center on academic research. The third of the, it, uh, taking into account the medtech startups and the technology. And last but not least, to uh, refer to Professor Pitet, uh, our personal experience. Where we are now, unfortunately, we have a lot of hospital-acquired infections with a lot of uh, or more than uh, half of a million uh, infections in the United States acute care hospitals uh, every year. The number of deaths 
uh, 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 related to hospital acquired infections are comparable with the population of Toledo, for example, Bourges, Burnley, or here in Switzerland uh, of St. Gallen. So not so, or pretty bad. One in three patients receive at least one antimicrobial. Is it really necessary? Do they really get to uh, have this treatment? Do they really ne need to have this treatment? Where we are in Europe, we are uh, even worse because we have more than four million hospital acquired infections every year, a lot of deaths, and unfortunately, every year there is a higher prevalence of hospital acquired infections. We have there Romania, Unfortunately, too, on all the ACDC maps, Romania has one of the strongest colors uh, among other countries. Why do we have so many hospital-acquired infections? Because we have a be better diagnostic, of course, a better research, more patients, more multidrug-resistant bacteria, and we have less antibiotics because we all know that the pipeline is dry or even it's empty. Usually, the epidemiologists launch uh, questionnaires, but this time we decided to ask the epidemiologists themselves. And, among, uh, and um, uh, up to their opinion, the biggest challenges in epidemiology are related to collaboration between uh, healthcare stakeholders, uh, related to patient compliance and uh, uh, education, regarding to training of the uh, healthcare workers, but in the meantime of the patients and the visitors, because we don't have to forget the visitors. And referring to staff and personnel, we have to think very well about compliance, about training, but most important, I think, about the uh, conscience, about the, uh, about the con con conscience uh, to a well done activity and to a well done uh, job. According to our colleagues, the, re the main reasons for infection transmissions are the lack or the insufficiency, the staff, and the non-involvement of each of us. Uh, of course, if we would have an unlimited budget for infection uh, prevention, I think we would use them, this money, uh, we, we would use this money for monitoring and testing the system. Not, or pretty much of them, Consider then the, the implementation of digital solutions for monitoring and prevention of hospital acquired infections, it would surely help. So this is uh, a pretty general uh, impression and idea. Which is our experience? We strongly believe that the digital inf uh, innovation represents the difference between, between the basic need and the high, nice to have. For an example, it represents the difference between a toothbrush and a lamp for aromatherapy, for example. That's why we implemented and tested an infection control digital platform as a pilot pr uh, project in uh, St. Constantine Hospital in Romania. The platform has basic functions referring to, map to mapping the facility with sampling points and risk classes. We plan and execute sampling procedures, and in the meantime, we had access to all data in one place. We had two interfaces. First of all, referring to monitor information, define processes, plan the activities, and overview of results, but most important, trends of these results. And the second interface referred to schedule tasks, to understand the samples and, the, and to acquire the data, and to make a link between the laboratory and the results. Uh, we, with the help of this uh, platform, we are able to map and point out at-risk uh, areas, and it helped us a lot to have an overview of the results uh, up to the places, time between samplings, and the results of the samplings. With the help of our, um, or with, with uh, some clicks, we could uh, ask the nurse to take samples from different places, uh, according to expected risk, for example, according to previous results and to time between samplings. We had the result in one time, uh, we, ha we had the results in the same place in real time and in evolution. Uh, it uh, assess it uh, assesses a better uh, understanding of uh, uh, performance of the cleaning staff, a better uh, 
com uh, better assesses of the uh, patient's compliance and in the meantime of the healthcare workers involvement. We had all the results very well and logical organized. Uh, it represents a valuable support in decision making. We took several samples like uh, swabs from surfaces and hands. Uh, UV fluorescence and uh, deep slides, we use a lot these uh, two methods. We tested water, air samples, and uh, sterility because in Romania we are uh, obliged to do this kind of tests. Uh, we had the overview of trends and evolution, and we all know nowadays that data is power. And I refer until now uh, at the past, but today is already the past, and let's look at the, pre at the future. I have picked some ideas are not all of them, and there are uh, a lot of other uh, good ideas. But I started to refer at uh, Fitzy Health. It is a complete, simple, and very smart uh, patient hygiene kit. But it was designed and created by a nurse. I think we should all uh, take into account the huge experience of nurses toward medical uh, practice because uh, the nurses are more related to uh, healthcare than the doctors are. They are uh, more in contact with patients than doctors are usually. I uh, refer to CBAC, uh, a novel biotech startup, which provides us live, live solutions for antimicrobial resistant bacteria. There is AeroGuard, it is a um, lactobacillus hybrid designed specifically to kill Pseudomonas and reduce the viscosity of mucus in. Um, Yes, cystic fibrosis. Thank you, John. And uh, it down regulate the, the down regulates the inflammatory immune response in the same uh, category of patients. Or I have referred to my back guard, uh, leaf therapeutic microbe delivered directly to infected lung to prevent and to treat the infections with non tuberculous uh, mycobacteria. We have robots using pulse xenon UV. To, in order to sterilize the rooms or hallways or uh, operating rooms. They provide two portable pods for outside hospital. There is smart uh, rub or uh, bio-vigil. There are, there, these are some uh, devices uh, to remind to the healthcare workers that they have really to, to wash their hands and to disinfect their hands. There is AMOS, an advanced, sorry, an, here, an advanced microbiologic observation system. It is provided my co by my colleague, Zaki. It is a point of care test. It is a very simple, a chip, not more than 20 cents per test. And with 94% accuracy uh, test to provide the difference be between a bacterial versus a viral infection. It is a very big and uh, real help for the primary care physicians and it is linked to an IT platform to have all the results in the same place. We can imagine the importance of this system, speaking about an uh, epidemic in a school, for example, with different kids uh, uh, addressing to differ, uh, different uh, doctors. If we will test our phones, we will see that uh, they are all contaminated. Most of the germs are multidrug resistant bacteria because we work in hospitals. Why cannot imagine a smart uh, phone case called Lolo uh, using a new smart material with zero electric conductance? It melts at 80 degrees and it sweats chlorhexidine or other uh, substances. We can think about this too. I have only three take home messages, but I think uh, they are the most, most important. First of all, the adoption of digital innovation is beyond, beyond nice to have. It is a real must nowadays. Innovation happens at all levels. Nurses, students, and patients. So we have to empower really people. And the third take home message, embrace the future and the paradigm shifts it brings. Thank you so much for your attention and sorry for my English. Thanks so much.
Would anyone have any questions? One second. Yes. Just. I want to ask about AMOS uh, for differentiation between viral and bacterial infection. Sorry? AMOS. You, yes. You, what, is that, uh, what are the tool and idea? It is a very simple idea uh, based on the um, or using microtubules to separate the, or to, to differentiate the components of the blood. It is a larger idea. It is still in tested, but uh, until now, uh, after one year of uh, testing, we have a high accuracy. Probably it will be a new device available from now in two or three uh, years. No, no, we are still testing it. It, uh, it is an idea coming from one of my colleagues. I work with him on this presentation. And probably we'll be able to present uh, the first official result in two years from now, I guess. Uh, yes, between the, the component of the, the blood. If you can give me an email address, I will send you all the data because are not so public yet. It is only the idea available for instant. Yes? Can you give the microphone, please? Thank you. Um, uh, to my knowledge, UV uh, for uh, environmental disinfection is not valid, or mm -hmm. it's not uh, that effective. Um, yesterday and today, uh, you are telling me that uh, UV light is very efficient and very effective. Is it uh, any uh, new idea about this, or my knowledge is wrong, or what? Uh, yes, there is a discussion between uh, UV, normal UV, and uh, uh, pulse uh, UV. Uh, I don't know, John, if you can help me with this information, because I know you know better than I. So there was a really nice uh, randomized control mm -hmm. intervention study published in The Lancet the year before last, showing that mm -hmm. the implementation of a UVC system reduced hospital-acquired infection. Um, it's a pretty good piece of work it published in The Lancet. Um, and for me, it's the evidence we need. It shows that implementing this on a routine basis improved patient outcomes. Uh, we can then discuss in detail about which UV system to use and they have advantages and disadvantages. It is a matter of implementation, how to implement, as I understand. It's not, um, um, yes, it's not just using UV, but yeah. it needs a specific way of implementation to be effective? As yeah, I, I mean, as with any intervention in any aspect of, well, I was going to say medicine, but anything really, implementation is key. We've got to make sure that we're using it as indicated and have clear communication to make sure that it's used in the right way. Okay. Yeah, and that there's no shadows and that, those kinds mm -hmm. of issues as well. Where the device is placed, you know, in some cases they use two devices because that reduces shadows, but where the light doesn't hit, it can't be effective. So it needs a, a, a good training for the for the healthcare worker who use the UV light yeah. to, to be yes. effective. Because um, you made a comparison yesterday between the hydrogen peroxide and uh, UV light, and I found that uh, UV light is much uh, effective, much more effective, much more effective. UV light is much more effective than hydrogen peroxide in environmental disinfection, as I understand. Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of raw efficacy in terms of the ability to reduce contamination on the surfaces actually HPV is a little bit better but it's harder to implement so then you have this playoff between a technology that's harder to implement but more effective versus one that's easier to implement slightly less effective and it's not clear where that balance should be and it's probably personal to some degree you know with what are the resources the hospital has how are their air ducts set up how and what's the in the rooms also, i think dependable trained personnel is needed for implementation of uv light Pardon? trained personnel for implementation of uv light for as a disinfectant is very important yeah. much more than hydrogen peroxide no, they're both really important mm -hmm. because you if you don't have trained personnel you're going to end up with an accident but the technology of uv is much more difficult as, as not necessarily it's not yeah. Should we move on? Yeah. Next question, please. Just to highlight what uh, my colleague is, is uh, stating, uh, if we're using hydrogen peroxide or uh, UV disinfection technologies, all of these are ad hoc technologies. They do not replace any manual cleaning and disinfection. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So this is the ground rule for it. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. And next up, I would like to reintroduce John Otter from London, Imperial College London. Thanks, Alexandra. Thanks for coming this afternoon. It's lovely to see a, a full hall. Everybody excited to talk about environmental hygiene, which has been a focus of my career um, over the last, actually, I don't know how long, 15 years? That's a bit long, isn't it? Anyway, um, environmental hygiene is a passion of mine. I think it's hugely important. There's loads more to do. But what we do have now that we didn't have then is much more powerful data and evidence that, that what we're doing actually makes an impact. And that's that's why I'm involved in this clean hospitals group, because I think there's potential for, ev for going further faster with this kind of collaboration. I have some disclosures to list, some of which are relevant to uh, what I'll be saying today. So we're talking about the cost and the value and the cost effectiveness of hospital cleaning and disinfection. So I think the place that we need to start is looking at the cost of things going wrong. What happens when we don't get cleaning and disinfection right with the outcome being more infections? Then we can look at the cost of cleaning and disinfection and then we can begin to talk about cost effectiveness. And even in recent months, we're better placed to have that conversation um, than we were previously. So, it won't surprise you to hear that healthcare-associated infection is expensive. The rise, inexorable rise of antimicrobial resistance is not helping us. It's making it even more expensive and even more difficult to treat. This is a really nice study published recently by a colleague from Imperial, Nikki Naylor, in ARIC. Um, it's free, open access, go and have a read, and it, it's, I think, one of the best summaries of the cost of healthcare-associated infection. Uh, Nick is an economist, so was able to bring those skills to bear in interpreting what can be quite tricky outcome data around the cost of infection. So you can see by bug and by syndrome, the costs are big. Let's just look, for example, at the cost of MRSA in the US, 7 million, 7 thousand million. So what's that? Seven billion? <laughs> Seven billion. Does that depend on American or English billion? I think it was... <laughs> anyway, it's a lot of money. Um, and, and the bottom row is even more important. So the global economic cost of resistance under a couple of different scenarios um, using different models. And I don't, I'm not even going to try to tell you what, not, what that number is, but it's, it's huge. It's a massive cost. And a, a massive, huge chunk of that is avoidable, not only through improved environmental hygiene, that's part of a bigger picture, um, but it's, I think it's low-hanging fruit. If we can get hospital cleaning and disinfection right, it should be a, a kind of basic requirement of, of hospital care. I hadn't seen that quote that Pierre highlighted earlier uh, around the patient being horrified at the state of the environment when they came into hospital. Uh, it's, it's something we can easily avoid. So looking in a little bit more detail about an example of the cost of hospital-acquired infection, we had an outbreak of CPE uh, at our hospitals in London that affected only 40 patients. The management, the sort of intensive management phase of the outbreak lasted about 10 months. And over that period of time, we, we looked back retrospectively to just bean count very carefully how much it cost us. And we had various different cost categories. We looked at actual expenditure, so the things that left um, left a hole in the balance sheet. We also looked at the opportunity cost. These were things that didn't actually change our financial position in terms of more money spent, but would have meant more money available if things were different. And I think those two categories are quite important to understand because the interpretation of these financial figures will be different depending on where you sit in an administration. So, for example, 
the, um, the chief finance officer. Do we have any, any chief finance officers here? No, that's good because I'm about to bag them. <laughs> so the chief finance officer only cares about the bottom line. They just want to know how much money they've got and how much is left to spend. This is a caricature, okay, it's not. But, but you take my point. Whereas the chief executive officer has to balance quality, risk, finance, and, and look at a wider picture. So the, the actual expenditure will mean more to the CFO and the, probably the opportunity cost to the CEO um, in this example here. So we, we found it helpful to break down the costs in that way. When we put the data into that model, we, we found that these 40 patients cost the organization a total of uh, a little over a million pounds over the course of those 10 months. A large chunk of that was in opportunity cost due to um, cancelled elective surgical revenue, and a big chunk of that was in staff time. Now, staff time is an interesting one because it's a cost that you've already committed. The staff will be working for you. They will be doing, um, they will be doing jobs for you. It'll just be a different job. So it consumed a lot of the time of the infection control team that could have been better spent looking at surgical site infection or uh, CLABSI or, or UTI, you know, other, other important jobs where much, much time is consumed managing this outbreak. And it's quite helpful to look at that cost in perspective of other, other outbreaks which have, have shown similar costs. Um, the size of the bubble represents the cost, so the, the big one million pound blue bubble at the top is, is our outbreak, so to speak. Uh, and the others cluster together a little bit lower down with, with less cases and generally shorter duration. Looking at all healthcare associated infection, there's a really nice model study in, um, in PLOS Medicine published a few years ago. And they were trying to rank the various different healthcare associated infection in terms of the, the economic burden that they imposed. So the top line shows the number of cases. So that's just the rank of the cases that they had in terms of SSI were the most and neonatal sepsis were the least. They then reordered that list based on the disability adjusted uh, life year burden. So this was an, an economic modeling approach to look at the overall financial impact rather than just the actual cost at a point in time. And when they did that, surprisingly, hospital acquired pneumonia turned up as the most expensive uh, in a hospital acquired infection. Now that surprised me, it may surprise some of you, um, particularly because we, we don't really spend a lot of time, probably not enough time, in looking at HAP prevention. The, the, the bottom line is nothing to do with the study, it's the world according to John, in terms of what I think is the, is the rank of priority that, that organizations tend to give to hospital acquired infection with the big tickets like hospital acquired C. diff and neonatal sepsis being at the top in terms of level of angst and level of, level of prevented prevention activity. Whereas some of the most expensive in terms of burden are actually at the bottom of that list. So we've probably got a little bit of thinking to do about whether our infection control and infection prevention programs ought to be slightly reconfigured to focus a little, a little more on some of the infections that have the big financial outcomes. So getting specific about the impact of hospital acquired infection related to the environment, um, we're now in a much stronger position to have this discussion than we were not very many years ago. I think this idea of the prior room occupant is really powerful uh, and really evocative and really helpful for us in illustrating the importance of environmental hygiene in transmission. What it shows is that if you're admitted to a room where the previous occupant had a bug, C. diff, MRSA, VRE, some of the resistant gram negatives, then the next occupant in that same room has an increased risk of acquiring that, that organism because of inadequate cleaning between the patient episodes, um, which is, uh, I think, a shocking state of affairs. Overall, the, the risk was doubled, so you were twice as likely to pick up one of these organisms if the previous occupant had uh, had the infection or colonization. Now I think we are, we're in a position where the evidence supporting improving environmental hygiene and disinfection is stronger than many of the other things we talk about and do in terms of infection control. Um, we, we now have a couple of cluster randomized trials 
showing that the implementation of UV improves patient outcomes, that a cleaning bundle improves patient outcomes. And these are significant findings from large, well-designed studies. Now, what this doesn't do is take us any further in terms of understanding the cost effectiveness of these interventions. Um, so we, we're getting towards the business end of what, what we're talking about today. So in order to understand cost effectiveness, first we, under, we need to understand the cost of the intervention itself. So how much does it cost to clean a hospital room? Would anyone like to hazard a guess? In pounds sterling, if you can. I'm probably the only person here who talks about pounds sterling. But Anyway, how much does it cost in any currency? Ten pounds. Ten pounds, okay. Start of a ten. Any advance on ten? <laughs> Going once. Yeah. Huh? Going once. Going once, yeah. <laughs> Anyone think more than ten? Quite a few people think more than ten. Anyone think loads more than ten? Is that the right order of magnitude? A few people. Okay. Well, I, I think the answer is it depends because there's lots of different ways that we can clean and disinfect a hospital room. I think if we use um, simple, low-cost products with, uh, of course, the lowest paid staff in the hospital, which are the environmental hygiene personnel, which is something that we need to think about and change, by the way, then the cost will be in that kind of 10, 15 pound bracket. If we're talking about some of the more advanced technologies that augment that cleaning process, we, we incur the cost of the cleaning, because we need that, and then the, the automated room decontamination system on top. So there will be a significant cost on, on top of that. So the, these is just uh, to, to illustrate the discussion, really. Um, this, this study was not designed to tell us what the cost of cleaning a hospital room was, actually. This was designed to look at the, the cost effectiveness of the different interventions. I've never seen anyone move for their phones so quickly. <laughs> it was like a collective movement. Um, so, so what they found was a, was a range in the kind of 15 to 120, 30 bracket. Uh, and that is including staff time, equipment costs, and consumables for each method. So we have some data on the cost of cleaning a hospital room. So just, um, just out in CID, if you're interested in this area at all, I recommend you go and pull this paper out and have a read. Um, I, I personally find uh, cost-effectiveness analyses really hard when I'm looking at the modeling outcomes and the charts and the different terminology, um, it, it's not our usual terms, but this paper is written in a medical journal, so it's written in a way that, that we've got a good chance of accessing it. So this is a cost-effectiveness analysis using the, the data from one of the large RCTs that I mentioned. So it was a randomized controlled trial in 11 um, Australian hospitals who implemented a cleaning bundle. Now, the cleaning bundle was quite interesting that they implemented because it wasn't a fixed bundle. They went in, they, they reviewed the processes that the hospital had and optimized them locally. So this was a bundle of cleaning and disinfection optimization. Um, the cost of that intervention was fairly low, relatively, at around about 350 um, US dollars. Uh, that's about 150 pounds sterling. And this generated cost savings of 147,000 um, US dollars. So it was a cost saving intervention based on the cost of the infections that didn't occur because of this intervention. I think that's the best way to describe it. So uh, the, the, the net monetary benefit of the, uh, of the intervention was a million US dollars. Uh, and the cost effectiveness ratio was around about 5,000 US dollars per quality gain, so that's the quality adjusted life year. So you paid, you paid five grand for each quality adjusted life year to, to buy, and that, in terms of thresholds for what is considered cost effectiveness, is very low. So it was an impressive outcome, which means there was a very high chance that the bundle would be cost effectiveness compared with the existing practice. So I'd recommend you go away and read this study because it's the best that's been published, I think, by a mile on the cost effectiveness of hospital cleaning and disinfection. And the outcome supports the idea that it is a cost effective approach. And it, this intervention was, was pretty easy to do. Any of us could go away and do it. We could go away, review the processes, optimize them, and hopefully have this sort of impact. 
There are some, some previous attempts along similar lines to, to do this sort of work. So this was a study um, in Scotland with Stephanie Dancer's group to look at the impact of, of hiring an extra cleaner to go and work on a ward. So they did a 12-month crossover study. The cleaner cost um, £12,000 a year. The cleaner cost £12,000 a year. How much do you cost to your organisation? I bet you none of you cost 12 grand a year. It's not very much money, so we need to think about that. Um, and each MRSA infection was assumed to cost 9K, so that was a, 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 an estimate from the literature which is reasonable, although there will be a big range. So what the study found was a 27% reduction in the rate of MRSA infection and an improvement in the financial position of between 30,000 and 70,000 with the range coming from the uncertainty of the, of the intervention effectiveness. And you can, you can do it yourself. So if you have a trend of infection data, uh, you can attach a financial cost to it pretty easily. So this is, for example, a study that I was involved with looking at C. diff infection rates. Um, hydrogen peroxide vapor was introduced. The rate of infection fell by 60%. So we could predict and model, if you like, that 67 cases in that two-year intervention period of C. diff were missing. They didn't happen. And attach a range of costs to those, um, given the published figures for the cost of HCAI, and come out with a, with a cost saving per annum of 130,000 to a million. So um, these, these, these are useful. They, they can help us with business cases, but I think we, do, we can now go to the more sophisticated, proper, if you like, cost-effectiveness analyses in order to support and make the case for hospital cleaning and disinfection. So moving on then, we've, we've only talked about cost-effectiveness of a single intervention. So, the, so what is the gold standard, I think, will be the comparative cost-effectiveness of different interventions when you have a microfiber cloth or a normal cloth when you have twice a day cleaning versus once a day cleaning, when you have UVC system A or UVC system B, the, the ultimate way of deciding between them is, is a comparative cost effectiveness analysis where you, you trial them, you test them, you have ideally clinical impact data and you attach cost to that clinical impact to decide which technology to go for. So an example of comparative cost effectiveness is uh, is in this study looking at two different ways to provide objective data on the quality of hospital cleaning. Um, sorry, three different ways. So they had um, bacterial surface cultures, ATP bioluminescence, and uh, fluorescent markers. And they worked out the cost per room of using those different methods, with surface cultures being 43 pounds, ATP being 21 pounds, and the fluorescent markers being much cheaper. Um, and depending on what the outcome was, you, you may conclude that the fluorescent markers are the way to go and the technology for you. But it will depend what you want to get out of it because ATP can do things that fluorescent markers can't. Another example of comparative cost effectiveness, so we're back to our study on the cost of cleaning a hospital room here. This is where they were getting to with that study, was they, they then artificially contaminated a hospital room with C. diff spores went through all of these methods in sequence and worked out how much they reduced the level of contamination so that they could begin to say, okay, looking at balancing the cost and the effectiveness, this is the way to go. So I, I've plotted these in such a way to show that the, the, the negative uh, on, the, on the, uh, the X axis at the bottom is, is a reduction in colony count versus their reference method, which was chlorine disinfection. So a negative direction over here is good. So in terms of cost effectiveness, I'd be looking for the, for the products that did better than, uh, than the reference method. And then the cost is illustrated on the right in the red bar. So in this study, in this setting, based on the outcomes here, I'd be thinking about, well, peracetic acid wipes improve the situation and don't cost massively more. Same with steam cleaning. Hydrogen peroxide, we need to think carefully about that cost and investment um, based on other systems. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make a technology comparison here, but just to illustrate how this sort of analysis would work. 
So trying to put all this together then, looking at the, the, uh, the value of hospital cleaning and disinfection, it's our job, I think, to, to demonstrate and to illustrate the value of hospital cleaning and disinfection to our administration. Otherwise, it's a bit of a soft target for cost cutting. I don't know whether that's been the case in, in where you work, but certainly in England, there has been a history of cost cutting around cleaning and disinfection. And that has, I think, undoubtedly reduced standards. So we need to invest in quality. We also need to find evidence and present evidence of improvements in quality related to investment in hospital cleaning. We need the right tools for the job and um, related to that is the innovation to make sure we're, we're on the cutting edge. We've got a lot to think about in terms of workforce. We, we were talking about language skills. It, it's such a simple thing, but if, if the staff don't have appropriate language skills, it will make doing their job very difficult. The commercial model we choose might be important, and there's some evidence for that that we'll look at just now. And finally, training and education, clearly that's important. An e-learning module, probably not going to cut it. We might need to think a bit more and invest a bit more in training and education for um, environmental uh, hygiene personnel. So who has an outsourced cleaning service in the hospital? that a contractor comes in and does it? Who has an in-house one? You lucky lot. So there's, there's some evidence. It's not the best evidence, I'll admit it, but there is some evidence that having an in-house hospital cleaning service actually is better in terms of infection outcomes. So this was a study looking at nationally available data in the NHS from 126 English hospitals and the hospitals that had in-house cleaning services did better at reducing MRSA bacteremia than did hospitals that had outsourced hospital cleaning and disinfection. Now, this is a correlation ultimately. It might not be causal, um, but I think it is quite interesting. And, and for those of you who have had both in-house and out-contracted services, you might well agree that, that there's probably something here. So the model that we choose to deliver environmental hygiene is also important. And finally, uh, I think we need to have a healthy dose of cost perspectiveness when we are interpreting data around cost effectiveness for hospital cleaning and disinfection. So if you are unlucky enough to be admitted to the ICU, then there probably won't be a junior member of staff standing there bagging you manually you will go on a ventilator. So it's a technological solution that the hospital recognises is a good investment. Um, how much does the Da Vinci robot cost? How many, how many 12K cleaner salaries could we, could we get with one Da Vinci robot? I mean, all these things have their place, but my point is hospitals have a willingness to pay and invest in, in people and technology if the need is, is perceived and communicated. We now have really good data, and, and some of which we talked about in, in this session, to, to show the hospital admin administration that hospital cleaning disinfection is not only worth investing in from a patient quality point of view, but it's also a cost-effective um, use of hospital funds. So healthcare associated infection AMR have, have big financial implications, bigger numbers than I can easily even communicate to you. Um, there's strong evidence that imp improving cleaning and dis disinfection works, and by works I mean improves patient outcomes. We now have strong data that improving cleaning and disinfection is not only effective, but it's also cost effective. And we need to work together to illustrate not only the, the effectiveness, but also the value of improving hospital cleaning and disinfection to hospitals in terms of the quality of care and patient outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, John. Do we have a few questions? Andrea, Pierre, do you want to come up as well and we'll, we'll take questions for everyone now? Hello. Yeah, sorry, fascinating presentation. Thank you very much. I was just wondering, 
because uh, clearly the, the, the focus there obviously is on, on, on reducing patient uh, uh, hospital-acquired infections, etc. So fascinating data. I was just wondering, were you, uh, are you familiar or has there been any data, uh, are there any data, has there been any research done in a similar way on, on fin the financial implications of staff, personnel, days lost, um, productivity in hospitals through infections, illnesses acquired through working? Yes, but so, so I think, so you're looking at any impact on, on, the, on the healthcare workforce, on the healthcare from workforce, hospital yeah. acquired infections for staff. Yes. Yeah, so certainly in, in norovirus outbreaks in terms of influenza and ILI, there's been some data showing that um, health, uh, health promotion initiatives in staff are cost effective. And also, of course, vaccination of staff is cost effective. So there is a body of literature out there around that. I'm not that familiar with, but I'm sort of faintly aware of it over there somewhere. Okay. And with reference to tuberculosis, particularly multi-resistant? Multi Pass. I I'm okay. not sure that healthcare staff acquisition of MDR-TB is common enough, fortunately, to, well, to do that. But you could model it. Yeah, we've come across some, some interest in that in some of some Asian countries, but sorry, that's, I'm just wondering, was there data? Thank yeah. you. Okay, thanks. One in the front here. Hello, World Alliance Against Antibiotic Resistance. I think what you, you, your picture is nicer than the reality because uh, hospitals don't like to declare hospital-acquired infection and there's a lot of hidden stuff. And also I was surprised by the, the French gentleman who talked about the procedure for cleaning in French hospitals, right? And I remember a major uh, national hospital in northern France when the staff came in to clean, they picked up all the objects that were on the floor, including my street shoes, and put them on the bed so they could wipe the floor. Uh, and so I, I think that you would need to have some uh, patient observance um, mechanism and not just have questionnaire to the direction of the hospital, how you do this, because in the questionnaire, you know, what's done on paper and what's done in reality, yeah. there's a lot of difference. You also mentioned outsourcing. And in that northern hospital, I went out and, uh, in the hallway afterwards to talk to the cleaners, and there were just you that had been hired, and they knew absolutely nothing on infection prevention and control, and I spent their uh, lunch hour with them for an hour explaining to them what it is, and they were fabulous youth. I mean, they would have loved to have some real training, you know, because they got that job because they had no other job in the area. So you have to look into that. And uh, last comment is you mentioned that pneumonia is actually what costs a lot. And I didn't see any discussion about uh, architecture. And I'm very concerned that even modern hospitals are actually sometimes worse than older hospitals in terms of figuring out the airflow. It's very bad. We all rely on air conditioning. And it's the communi best com way to communicate disease, in fact, in many ways. So, if you have a comment on that, okay. So, three things. Um, first, Pierre, do you want to comment on the uh, on the on the on the feedback about the survey and the, for, and for the, the shoes French on the floor? Part, uh, obviously, everything is not far from perfect in France. Uh, <laughs> just a survey of what we are trying to implement, but there's a lot of uh, bad uh, behaviors, uh, obviously. Uh, in in France, uh, uh, the patients' association has the same vision than you, so that they no more want. Uh, quality indicators without the involvement of patients and the vision inside of patients. No more assessment by professionals only. And we have in France the quality indicators uh, about the satisfaction evaluation of, by the patients made after the hospitalization online without connection with the hospitals. And inside we have the assessment of the quality of the room, including the cleanliness. The very bad scores are around 4%, which is already too high. But it's, at the time, the, the assessment by the patients in France. I'd like to make a comment about the in-house versus uh, external cleaning companies. I think that part of the reason why you see such a big difference is that most hospitals will go to external cleaning companies because they want to save money. I don't think it's because external cleaning companies are inherently bad. I think you get what you pay for, whether internal or external. 
Yeah, I, I, I was going to make a similar point, really, that, that the, the T-shirt that the environmental hygiene staff are wearing is irrelevant. It's about the investment and the training program that is available for them. Yeah, exactly. You can't outsource the responsibility if people didn't hear that. Did that cover your questions? Uh, about the architecture? And oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, the ventilation aspect. Yeah, I, I agree. So there's, there's actually some really interesting research suggesting that uh, what we might consider an older approach to hospital ventilation may even be better. So trying to, try to increase natural ventilation and rely less on artificial ventilation might be a better approach. But I... I accept we're not there yet. Um, I was interested in your discussions that you had about whether you should call this initiative clean hospitals or environmental hygiene. And just wondered, you decided for yourselves, but whether you've gone to your target audience and see how they interpret those two terms. We had the opportunity to do um, a pilot study of members of the general public asking them what they thought was the difference between cleaning and hygiene. And it was very interesting that uh, I think maybe a bit more than 50% knew the difference. Hygiene was more than just cleaning. But then about 38% just thought hygiene and cleanliness were the same thing. So it's a bit like the patient. He's neurotic about the bit of dust on the floor, but he's quite happy about the nurse advancing on him, him with um, what looks like clean hands. Mm -hmm. And then there was a, the last 8% uh, thought that cleaning meant using a detergent and hygiene meant using a disinfectant. So I wonder whether you might consider just finding out how, what your target audience think, because obviously uh, we're all members of the public and we all start in, as members of the public when we're children picking up these ideas. And I feel that unless and until people, people are so confused about it now, we're too clean for our own good and all these messages that are being fed to us, that if we're going to improve standards of hygiene in hospitals and at home, which is my interest, we've got to get around this business of terminology, um, which is a problem in communication. Sorry, John, you know it's my hobby horse. Yeah, no, we've talked about it loads, but... Yeah, because it's a, it's a challenge and we must make the difference between uh, what is required at home and what is required in hospital and that the purpose are not the same, but uh, we have not the knowledge about everything we were discussing about UVC uh, just at the beginning. Uh, if you are interested in this topic, you have a very nice paper review by uh, John Boyce in the last issue of uh, Infection Control and Hospital Epidemiology and discussing about to which extent UVC should destroy microorganisms. It's three log reductions or, or more. So we have still a lot of discussion around this and the purpose of clean hospitals is also to have common goals and to define in which situation we just clean in which situation we should go further, by which way, to which extent. There's a lot of question at the time, so maybe before informing the general public, we have to stay together and to have a, to a shared opinion on what we are going. And as we have seen the European survey, there's a lot of differences at the time on the topic and the vision around that. So yeah, terminology is tricky and it's difficult to agree even amongst a small group of experts. Um, but we, we, dis we, we were keen to get hygiene in there because I think it is a a powerful word that, that means more than clean, so, so it was sort of subheaded environmental hygiene network to try and get that across. Uh, hello, Keith McGlone. I, my question is, in America we see them using a carrot and stick, uh, the idea of punishing hospitals that are in the lowest quartile on infections to get these, those hospitals to react. Uh, your numbers uh, show that the, from a financial perspective there's good reason for administration to act. I guess my question is, is there a place that in the analysis that there may be value in adding some kind of a carrot and stick uh, to the organizations as well? Um, as far as carrot and stick goes, what I've personally seen is more in the field of hand hygiene and in some of the different countries that we visited uh, to do trainings. And there are countries out there that have a 95% compliance. And their, uh, their ministries of health have imposed on them to at least have a 90% compliance. And their multi-drug resistant organisms are through the roof. And Carrot and stick is all good and fine if everything else is, is behind it. And I'm personally not convinced, though, that it's the best way 
forward because it encourages people to give you the answer that you're, that you're looking for. And very often the failures that we have in environmental hygiene are more, it's not because people don't care or because they don't want to do well, it's because they don't know what, how important their jobs are, it's because they don't get a, a sufficient training or sufficient compensation. It's because even from a hospital management perspective, they don't know how important those jobs are. So I think you'll probably get, and this is really just my view, but you'll probably get far better results from a, a positive and educational and sort of sustainable approach than from saying, you know, this room needs to be clean or X. And we see that a little bit in, so our own hospitals, we use, uh, we use ATP to check, and in other hospitals, they use uh, the fluorescent gel. Both have their place, both are useful. ATP is a lot more expensive, but the reason why our, our, the guy that, that trains all the environmental hygiene personnel, the reason why he uses ATP every six months per person instead of using fluorescent gel all the time is so that the personnel don't feel trapped. They don't feel like they need to carry a little black light in their pocket and they don't need to feel like we're checking what they're doing and we're micromanaging what they're doing. We can tell them clean this sink and be next to them and then once they've cleaned the sink, we say, okay, let's see what we have. Okay, there's still some residue. Where is the issue? Is it in how in the direction we're wiping? Is it because something's wrong with your solution? It, it can be a number of things, but it's a sort of a more pedagogical and positive approach. So I know we use that in our own hospitals and I, it, it's something that I believe quite strongly in personally. At the French level, we have the same approaches. Uh, the government is giving added monies to those who have good in quality indicators and not cutting the income of the others. But at the time, we have zero indicators in the field of quality of environmental control. It's other things, but not in this field. And I think, too, that this problem highlights the importance to go directly to the consciousness of uh, healthcare stakeholders. Because if they will understand the importance of their work and uh, uh, the importance of their uh, activity, that, uh, they, uh, that uh, the importance of daily activity, they will act better than uh, just doing something because they have to do it. So we have to go further and uh, act to the consciousness. If Martin Keenan was here, he'd say, he who complies against his will is of his own opinion still, which is always a good one. Okay, so I'm really sorry to say it's four o'clock, which means we have to finish. So can I just thank the panel and all the organizers and you for coming.